Speed and reliability in our rail travel service are major requirements of British Rail's customers. Punctuality is necessary to achieve timetabled connections and turnaround times. Failure of insulated joints has a serious effect on the reliability of the service we can offer. There are many thousands of insulated joints on British Rail and depending upon the nature and location of a failure, it can take up to 24 hours to restore the track to line speed, during which time dozens of trains can suffer delay. It is for this reason that we have selected the repair and maintenance of insulated joints as the subject for this video program in our new training series. In order to appreciate the importance of insulated joints to the efficient operation of today's modern signalling system, it's necessary to understand the way in which the system functions. This graphic will help to show what happens. The track is split into track circuit sections at half to three quarter mile intervals. Separating one section from the next is an insulated joint. This joint ensures that each track circuit section is a complete electrical circuit in itself around which a current flows continuously. The circuit has to include a control mechanism to operate the signals. The current is routed from the rail by cables to a line side cabinet which contains electromagnetic switches called relays. The relay holds the signal in the green position while it remains energized. As a train passes over the insulated joint, its wheels and axle short the next track circuit, causing the relay switch to be released and the signals behind the train go to red. As the train clears subsequent signals, the signal sequence of yellow, double yellow and green is set up. The whole signalling system is therefore dependent upon the proper operation of the electrical circuit in each track circuit and the effective insulation of one track circuit section from the next. It is in this respect that the insulated joint plays such a vital role. Insulated joints can fail for a number of reasons. In this case, the rust patch on the fish plate shows that water has got into the joint. This indicates that the resin bonding which helps to secure the fish plates to the rail and provides insulation has started to deteriorate. The rusting of the running on end shows that a drop has occurred between the two rail ends. Two of the huck fasteners have been temporarily replaced with ordinary bolts and temporary packing has been used to replace the missing resin. All measures to keep the line open, but all problems which can only be solved properly by a full repair of the insulated joint. The end of the joint painted white shows signs of deterioration on the running on end of the top surface. The joint is also suffering from severe lipping on both the running on and running off ends. This lipping effect is produced by pressure from trains which squeeze and stretch the rails at the end. This joint is showing considerable signs of lipping and the gap between the two rail ends has narrowed to a point where it's an excellent candidate for causing signal failure. In this program we're going to look at three methods of repairing insulated joints and we'll begin with this fairly common problem of lipping. The object is to restore the proper gap across the joint and the correct method is to saw the two lipped rail ends. Using the metal saw on the rail ends can itself lead to a short circuit of the section and the repair can only be undertaken after the track chargeman has obtained clearance from the signalman to work on the joint. Um, we have a little problem in Lee Grave Junction. We've got a lip joint on the up fast. This clearance will be given for a short period between trains in order to avoid interruption of the traffic flow in accordance with section T2. Once the signal has been turned to red and the hand signalman positioned, the track chargeman can begin work on the joint. Using a hacksaw, the two rail ends should be sawn across at right angles to provide a gap the width of the insulated end post. As with any work of this nature on the track, it's imperative that a lookout is posted, even though the signal has been turned to danger. Once the sawing operation is complete, the filings and brake dust surrounding the plates should be thoroughly cleaned off. The track chargeman should now leave the track, accompanied by his lookout, and give up the T2 possession.
where there are signs of greater deterioration in the joint and the supporting components, such as the sleepers, a program of heavy maintenance may need to be carried out on the site. Inspection around the joint has shown that the concrete sleepers either side of the joint are damaged and need replacing. The two sleepers either side of the insulated joint must match in size and depth to give maximum stability. The replacement sleepers are the same dimensions as those already fitted, so it will only be necessary to replace the two damaged sleepers. Incorrect sleeper spacing is one of the most common causes of damage to insulated joints and the sleepers either side of the joint are the most critical. General sleeper spacing on tracks where line speeds exceed 100 miles an hour should be 650 millimeters measured from the center of each sleeper. The spacing at the joint will vary according to the type of joint fitted. This spacing should be in accordance with standard instructions and in this example of a standard six-hold glued joint it should be 630 millimeters. In this Burns four-hold glued joint, the spacing should be increased to 635 millimeters. Where line speeds are less than 100 miles an hour, the general sleeper spacing should be 700 millimeters. New sleepers must be squared and spaced correctly, and existing sleepers must receive the same attention as part of the repair. In this instance, the new concrete sleepers which will be used to replace the damaged sleepers have been delivered to the side of the line about a hundred yards from the repair point. The sleepers will be moved to the site on the up-slow line using a trolley, an operation that can only take place when a Section S possession of the up-slow line is in force. The track gradient must be checked before trolley work can be carried out and if the gradient is 1 in 50 or steeper, trolleys must not be used on the line because the brake may not hold. The brake must be applied before the loading operation begins in order to ensure that the trolley does not move. The new sleepers have to be manually loaded onto the trolley using special tools. It requires eight men trained to work as a team using the proper lifting technique in order to avoid injury or mishap. The track chargeman must ensure that a red flag is in evidence throughout the trolley working and when the two brakes have been released from the wheels he must put a man in charge of the handbrake to control the speed of the trolley. At the site where maintenance is to be carried out, the new sleeper should be unloaded as quickly as possible to make the line available for traffic. The sleepers must be put down safely between tracks and the gang must respond promptly to look out warnings in the normal way. Once the trolley has been cleared, it should be moved in the direction of traffic to the nearest forward access point, lifted from the track and padlocked at the line side for security. Line possession can now be handed back to the signalman. The gang dig out the ballast from around the first of the damaged sleepers as far as the two adjacent sleepers to a depth of approximately two inches below bottom of sleeper level. This allows the new sleepers to be slid under the foot of the rail without the need for lifting the rail, including clearance for the pandrol housings which project above the upper surface of the sleeper. The existing sleeper remains in position until the replacement sleeper has been lifted in alongside. This ensures that the track is supported for traffic use. Once the replacement sleeper is in position, the fastenings on the damaged sleeper can be removed. These include the pandrol clips, the nylon insulators and the rail pads. Using two hydraulic jacks, the rail is then raised slightly to enable the damaged sleeper to be barred sideways and the new sleeper moved onto the vacated stool. The rail pads should be replaced with new ones. The worn insulators replaced with black plastic nylon insulators and the old pandrol clips replaced with new E2001 clips. These provide a stronger clamping force between the rail and the concrete sleeper and help to prevent pulling apart of the insulated joint. Once the new sleeper has been properly secured, the damaged sleeper can be removed to the side of the track and the gang can set about tackling the second sleeper. It's important to bear in mind at all times that this kind of repair is carried out while the track is open for traffic and the new sleepers should be properly supported. 
This is achieved by shovel packing, simply pushing the ballast underneath the sides of the sleepers with shovels. The top of the track must of course be at the correct cross level. The sleepers are raised and lowered using jacks on the rails according to the levels shown on the cross level gauge. The sleepers are then temporarily boxed in with ballast for added stability and the track is able to support traffic with complete safety. To complete the repair, the fastenings for six sleepers either side of the insulated joint must be replaced. If the sleepers are gouged by the rail, domino pads should be used. The rail pads and insulators are vital to the insulation of the track. If the pads or insulators are worn through, as shown here, the current can pass from the rail to the concrete sleeper and in wet weather it can be conducted across the rails by the water lying on top of the sleeper resulting in failure of the track circuit. With the rail jacked up and the old fittings removed the new rail pad is slid into position beneath the rail. The rail is centered between the two pandrol housings using a pan setter and the nylon insulators inserted on both sides of the rail. Finally, the rail is secured to the sleeper with pan draw clips fixed in position by a pan puller. Any sleepers which are incorrectly spaced or off square must be barred into position. As demonstrated here, a square will quickly show if the sleeper has moved off the correct line. As we pointed out earlier in the program, incorrectly spaced and misaligned sleepers are a major cause of failure in insulated joints because the joint is not properly supported to withstand the constant hammering from traffic. With the new fastenings in position and the sleepers correctly spaced and aligned, the top of the track must be restored to the correct level by raising and packing each sleeper in turn, using sighting boards and a cross-level gauge to indicate the correct levels. Two methods are available for packing sleepers. The preferred method, shown here, is known as Kango packing, in which hammer heads are fitted to the Kango power tools and used to force the ballast underneath the sleeper from both sides simultaneously. This method has the benefits of speed and efficiency and is complementary to the tamping equipment now in common use on the permanent way. An alternative method which has been in use on British Rail for many years is measured shovel packing. The sleepers are supported in position by a firm bed of stone chippings spread underneath the sleepers with shovels. The amount of chippings required to raise the sleeper to the desired height is determined using sighting boards, cross-level and void meters. These Pell gauge void meters are clamped to the rail foot alongside each sleeper. When a train passes over the line, it pushes a collar downwards and a gauge measures the depression in steps which each represent one canister of stone chippings. Where the joint itself is damaged, Heavy repair of the kind we've just seen is not sufficient. There are two options available. If the rail ends are crippled, the correct solution may lie in cutting in and welding a new length of rail, in which a prefabricated insulated joint has been fitted in the workshops. This joint may be of the four-hold variety, as shown here, or six-hold, which provides greater strength and stability at the joint and is being used increasingly on British rail. In this instance, the rail ends are undamaged and the problem lies in the failure of the resin at the base of the joint. The solution is to replace the joint itself. Replacement of defective insulated joints will always involve taking possession of the line and therefore interfering with the traffic flow. To minimize this interruption of the railway business, the gang tackling the problem has to be trained to a high level of efficiency. They must carry out the work in a safe manner and the track chargeman's initial briefing will include a reminder of the safety practices which have to be followed. Now we'll walk to site on the down fast cess and remember when you're blown out by the lookout man your place of safety will be the down fast cess. Okay. Before setting out to replace the insulated joint the man in charge must ensure that he has a set of replacement fish plates, an insulated end post, four bolts and nuts, a resin mix kit, a hammer, a scraper tool, wire wool, a spanner and a torque wrench. In order to carry out this level of repair, a T3 possession of the line is necessary, giving precise start and finish times for the possession. The joint to be replaced is a four-hole glued joint secured by nuts and bolts. 
Before removing the bolts, it's essential to apply tensors across the joint in order to maintain the stress conditions in the long welded rail. This hydraulic stressing equipment is fitted to the rail either side of the joint and pumped by hand to a pressure of 4,000 pounds per square inch to hold the two rail ends securely in position. Work can now begin on the joint itself. The nuts are released using a spanner or a power tool and the bolts can be removed. Some force is needed to loosen the bolts which have been bonded in position with resin for some years. The fish plates themselves can be equally difficult to remove because they've also been held in place with a thick layer of resin for a long time. Steel wedges hammered in behind the fish plates will usually do the trick. The rail ends behind the fish plates need to be thoroughly cleaned using a chisel to remove the old resin from the plates and a file to clean off the resin from the bolt holes. In this instance, the nylon insulating end post proved to be in good condition. But where the post has deteriorated, the rails must be pulled apart and a new post inserted. Before the new fish plates are fitted, the rails need to be lined up correctly in both the vertical and horizontal planes. A straight edge is used to check the alignment on top of the rail and a wedge inserted between rail and sleeper to adjust any misalignment. The straight edge is also used to check horizontal alignment and a steel wedge inserted between the rail and the pandrol housing to make any necessary adjustment. The joint is now ready for the final stage of the repair. First, the fish plates should be offered up and the bolts pushed through to check that everything fits correctly. Now the pack of resin should be heated in warm water and the ingredients mixed thoroughly before coating both fish plates liberally. A spatula should be used to spread the resin over all the surfaces of the plates which are in direct contact with the rail. The fish plates are placed in position and the bolts push through the holes. The nuts are put on with a small hand spanner and the plates are finally locked in position by tightening the nuts with a torque wrench to the recommended tension for the plates being used. The signal and telegraph staff check that the insulation at the joint is effective and that the track circuit is operating properly. Once the hydraulic stressing equipment has been removed, all sleepers must be correctly spaced and aligned. As we saw earlier in the example of heavy maintenance, the track must be checked for top and repaired through as necessary, including the renewal of all fastenings for six sleepers either side of the insulated joint. The job is complete. The refurbished joint should render good service for some years to come, keeping traffic moving and helping British Rail give its customers the quality of service they require.